Thank you to Surfshark VPN for sponsoring this video. Surfshark is a virtual private network that encrypts your online data and protects your privacy. Anytime you use the internet, whether on your computer, phone, or tablet, you are vulnerable to your data and location being monitored. With Surfshark, you can stay secure on all of your family's devices using just one account. Surfshark does not only provide you with added levels of protection as you use the internet. It can also provide benefits in your day-to-day -day online activity. Surfshark allows you to shop for the best deals online by preventing websites from raising prices based on your location or the type of device you are using, particularly when you are trying to book a hotel, flight, or car rental. Surfshark also allows you to change your virtual location by switching to a server in a different country. Surfshark has over 3,200 servers in 65 countries, so you have plenty of options. Switching your virtual location allows you to access online content that may be blocked in the country you are trying to access it from. It also means that you can view the catalogs various streaming services offer in different countries, meaning you have the ability to enjoy a service's full array of content, not just what is offered in your country. Surfshark offers 24-7 customer support via live chat, email, or social media, as well as a 30-day money-back guarantee. You can get Surfshark VPN by clicking on the link in the description box. When you use the link and enter promo code CASEFILES, you will receive 83% off, as well as an extra three months for free. Thank you. On Friday, July 11th, 1969, Russell Metcalf ate lunch with his best friend, Theodore Ted Conrad, at the Flaming Embers restaurant in Cleveland, Ohio. Russell and Ted liked the burgers the restaurant served, and it was close to the banks where they each worked. The lunch was nothing out of the ordinary, and the two men made plans to play golf the following afternoon. Ted did not show up for golf the following day, and Russell never saw him again. When Ted returned to work at the Society National Bank headquarters on Cleveland's Public Square after his lunch with Russell, he had a large paper bag with him. He made sure to show off that he had bought a fifth of whiskey and a carton of cigarettes. His 20th birthday had been the day before, so it made sense that he wanted to celebrate over the weekend. No one was concerned when Ted left the bank carrying that same bag after signing out at the end of his workday. The following Monday morning, however, the bank had two major problems, which they would ultimately realize were connected. Ted Conrad, a reliable employee, had not reported for work and could not be reached. In addition, $215,000, equivalent to approximately $1.7 million in 2021, was missing from the bank's vault. It was quickly apparent that when Ted Conrad left the bank on July 11th, the paper bag he carried contained not only whiskey and cigarettes, but also $1,500 $100 bills, $1,250s, and $250.20s. By the time it was discovered that the money had been taken from the vault, Ted had taken full advantage of his two-day head start and was nowhere to be found. Ted was born in Denver, Colorado, and spent his early years moving around the country, following his father's various postings as a Navy officer. His parents eventually divorced, and Ted chose to live with his mother and older sister. His mother later remarried, giving Ted a stepfather and two stepbrothers. Ted met his friend Russell at Lakewood High School, west of Cleveland. Both boys played linebacker for the school football team, but neither of them was talented enough to start for the team. They bonded in part over the fact that they both felt like outsiders, because they had both moved to Lakewood partway through high school. Ted had moved there during his sophomore year, and Russell during his junior year. In high school, Ted was well-liked, but not necessarily popular. He did not have a circle of close friends, but was respected enough to get himself elected to the student council during his senior year. He was intelligent, with an IQ of 135, and became a member of the National Honor Society. While Ted was well-spoken, he generally kept to himself. His classmates would later describe him as polite and clean-cut, someone who had big plans for an accomplished future. After graduating from Lakewood High in 1967, Ted enrolled at New England College in New Hampshire, where his father was working as an assistant professor of political science following his retirement from the Navy. Ted seemed to do well at the school and was even elected president of the freshman class. 
However, Ted decided to leave school after just one semester. He returned to Ohio and began taking night classes at Cuyahoga Community College. He began his job at the headquarters of the Society National Bank in January of 1969. While it was not clear at the time why Ted left New England College, it would later be theorized that he eventually took the job at the bank specifically for the purpose of pulling off his heist. Ted had been obsessed with the 1968 Steve McQueen movie The Thomas Crown Affair, in which the titular character, a debonair millionaire, orchestrates a complex bank robbery just for the adventure of it, and subsequently engages in a game of cat and mouse with a beautiful insurance investigator. Ted saw the film at least half a dozen times. His obsession with the film was not necessarily alarming at first. According to his friend Russell, there were plenty of other young men their age who loved Steve McQueen at the time and aspired to be like him. Seeing McQueen dressed in three-piece suits and outsmarting the authorities made the character of Thomas Crown seem like someone with an enviable lifestyle. While his manners and intelligence meant that Ted could have arguably been described as a gentleman even at his young age, Ted appears to have begun focusing on the more materialistic idea of what one should be. He convinced his grandmother to lend him money so he could buy a bright red sports car, which he drove while wearing leather driving gloves. He began trying to appear more debonair, showing off his fluency in French, skill at billiards, and love of expensive gin. His fixation with the film may have inspired him to steal from his employer. While he tried to emulate Thomas Crown's high-end lifestyle in the small ways he could, it appears that, like millionaire Thomas Crown, Ted essentially wanted to commit a major theft just for fun, and to show off how clever he was, rather than for financial gain. Ted had started shoplifting, just to prove that he could do so successfully. Ted had called Russell on the evening he stole the money, but Russell was not at home at the time, so Ted was only able to speak to Russell's mother. Russell believes that had he been home that night, his friend would not have had to flee. I still believe had he been able to speak to me or someone else, and showed us the money, he would have just put it back on Monday morning, for it was less about the money than proving he could do it, Russell would later say. As it was, Ted never got to tell Russell about the theft. Russell learned about the theft after the bank discovered it on Monday morning. Responding FBI agents called Russell, ordering him to come into the bank where he was employed to tell them everything he knew about his friend. Prior to the theft, Ted had begun telling friends, including some who worked at the bank with him, how easily he could steal from the vault because of the lax security at the bank. Society National Bank did not even fingerprint its employees. He claimed that all he needed to do was find a way to be left in the vault alone. He said he would commit the crime on a Friday, because doing so would give him the entire weekend to get out of town before anyone even realized that the money was missing. Ted reportedly called a friend on July 11th to say the day had finally come for him to take the money, but the friend did not believe that Ted was actually going to commit the crime. Ted had decided to go through with the theft on that day in particular, because circumstances had aligned to make it possible for him to do so. While Ted had only been employed at the bank for just over six months, he was a stellar employee his co-workers believed would rise through the ranks at the bank very quickly. He worked in the bank's vault, packaging and delivering cash to other branches of the bank, a position which the bank only allowed its most trusted employees to fill. On the day of the theft, Ted's supervisor was out of work, recovering from surgery. It was against bank policy for any employee to be left alone in the vault, but Ted was essentially left unsupervised that day, meaning he had the opportunity to be alone in the vault. Since Ted was considered to be such an upstanding young man and trustworthy employee, no one at the bank was particularly concerned when he walked into the vault with the large paper bag after his lunch break. Ted was seen by his landlady at 7.26 p.m. outside of his apartment on Clifton Boulevard. He waved to her as he was getting into a cab, which took him to Cleveland Hopkins International Airport. There, he used a payphone to call his girlfriend Kathleen and tell her that he was going to Erie, Pennsylvania for the weekend to attend a concert. Ted's relationship with Kathleen would allow law enforcement to track Ted's initial movements around the country after he fled with the cash. She received a letter from Ted on July 17th that had been postmarked at Washington's National Airport, 
and another on July 22nd, postmarked in Inglewood, California, near Los Angeles International Airport. Authorities were also able to record a phone call Ted made to her. In the letters to his girlfriend, Ted admitted to stealing the money, and ultimately expressed some remorse over his crime. In one of the letters, he indicated that he believed he could return to Ohio and his loved ones after seven years, when the statute of limitations had expired. However, as smart as he was, and as clever as he believed himself to be, Ted had misinterpreted the law. Authorities had to charge him within seven years, and since he was so quickly identified as the perpetrator of the theft, he was indicted within weeks. The clock had stopped on the statute of limitations as soon as he had been indicted for his crimes, meaning he could be arrested no matter how much time passed. On September 12, 1969, Ted Conrad was indicted by a federal grand jury on charges of embezzlement and falsifying bank records. A warrant for his arrest was subsequently issued. He faced up to 10 years imprisonment for each of the charges against him. The FBI and the U.S. Marshal Service initially quarreled over jurisdiction in the case, which was one of the largest bank thefts in Cleveland's history. Ultimately, both agencies investigated the case. Authorities followed up on leads across the continental United States, as well as in Hawaii, after a couple from Cleveland vacationing there in October of 1969 saw a man they believed resembled Ted. Ted's best friend Russell believed Ted had used the money to go abroad, perhaps to sail around the world. Russell was contacted by investigators periodically as the decades passed. They believed Russell to be the person from his life prior to the theft Ted was most likely to contact. Russell never heard from him. Every few years, authorities would get warrants for the phone records of Ted's loved ones to look for calls they could not account for and could have come from Ted, but they never found any record of him contacting anyone. The letters and calls to his girlfriend, just after he left town, appear to be the last communications Ted ever had with any of his loved ones. Over the years, Ted was featured in local media and on national programs such as America's Most Wanted. Deputy U.S. Marshal John Elliott remained dedicated to bringing Ted Conrad to justice, even as decades passed without him being located. He continued following up on leads, submitting information to international agencies, and collecting evidence that could one day be used to prove that a suspect really was Ted Conrad, should a promising one ever be identified. He was so focused on the case that it became a regular conversation topic with his family. One of the reasons I stayed after this guy is that some people thought he was some kind of hero or Robin Hood. He's not. He's nothing but a thief. A young, smart-ass thief who just managed to elude law enforcement for all these years. Hopefully, we can bring him to justice soon, John explained in 2008. Another potential reason for John's fixation with catching Ted Conrad was the multiple small ways their lives had intersected prior to the theft. Like Ted, the Elliott family lived in the suburb of Lakewood. John and Ted went to the same doctor, and Ted briefly worked in a shop where John would take his son to get ice cream. That son was Peter Elliott, who eventually followed in his father's footsteps by joining the U.S. Marshals Service. The elder Elliot retired in 1990 without ever locating and arresting Ted Conrad, but did not lose his interest in the case. He came in to go over his files in the case regularly after his retirement. Ultimately, the role of officially pursuing Conrad would fall to his son Peter. John Elliot would pass away without ever seeing the resolution to the Conrad case. He and his son Peter continued talking about it until the very end of his life. While John was in hospice, his son played an episode of a documentary series for him. The episode focused on the Conrad case, and John had appeared in it. John Elliott passed away in his sleep just a few days later, on March 20th, 2020, at the age of 83. While he spent decades obsessed with the Conrad investigation, his largest professional contribution is arguably the major role he played in Cleveland's mob wars. He helped establish the Witness Protection Program in Northern Ohio in the early 1970s, which proved vital as mob violence escalated in the following years. In the grand scheme of the investigation, John Elliott ultimately just barely missed, living long enough to see the Ted Conrad case finally be closed. Unfortunately, so did Ted Conrad. 
On November 12, 2021, more than 52 years after Ted Conrad's heist and escape, the U.S. Marshals Service announced that the fugitive had been identified. He had been living outside of Boston since 1970, under the name Thomas Randall. Unfortunately, he could not be arrested, as he had died less than six months earlier. The major break in the case came when U.S. Marshal Peter Elliott received a tip about an obituary published in the Linfield News, a weekly publication in the suburbs of Boston. He has not publicly disclosed who brought the obituary to his attention. The obituary was for 73-year-old Thomas Randall, who had died of lung cancer in May of 2021. According to Tom's obituary, his life overlapped with Ted Conrad's in very general ways. They had both been born in Denver and had both been born on July 10th, although Tom's birth year was listed as 1947, two years before Ted's. They shared some more specific details as well. The obituary listed Tom's alma mater as New England College, the same small school Ted had attended for a semester, and Tom's parents had the same first names, Edward and Ruthabeth, as Ted's parents. Tom and Ted's mothers also had the same maiden name. Knowing that people who create false identities tend to borrow details from the real life they leave behind, Peter began investigating the possibility that Tom Randall was really Ted Conrad. One of the main pieces of evidence that confirmed that Ted Conrad had gone on to live out his life as Tom Randall after stealing from the bank had originally been preserved by Peter's father. John Elliott had been able to track down Ted Conrad's original 1967 application to New England College, which contained Ted's signature. In 2021, his son was able to track down the legal papers Tom Randall had filled out when he was filing for bankruptcy in Boston Federal Court in 2014, which included his signature. Peter was able to submit the documents for analysis, which concluded that they had been signed by the same individual. Based on further document and handwriting comparison, as well as what the U.S. Marshals Service has only described as additional investigative information, they positively identified Thomas Randall as Theodore Conrad. When Peter Elliott and his deputy went to the home where the man known in Massachusetts as Tom Randall had lived since 1986 to inform his widow that the man she had been married to for almost 40 years had not been who she believed him to be, she was not surprised by their arrival or by the news they brought. She admitted that on his deathbed, just before he became too weak to speak, her husband had disclosed to his family that his real name was Theodore Conrad and that he had been living under an assumed name because he was wanted for a bank theft he committed back in 1969. She also said he expressed remorse for his crime, a sentiment which Peter Elliott believes is genuine. No one in the Randall family will face any charges for failing to report this confession. Ted began assuming his new identity in January of 1970 when he went to the Social Security office in Boston to apply for a Social Security number using the name Thomas Randall. His location, like the first name he chose, may have been inspired by the movie that inspired his crime. The Thomas Crown Affair had been largely filmed in the Boston area. The Social Security Administration did not begin implementing the enumeration at birth process until the late 1980s, and it was common at the time for individuals to not apply for a Social Security number until they reached adulthood. When he applied for the Social Security number, he provided the same day and month for his birthday, but changed the year of his birth to 1947, two years before he was actually born. Once he was able to obtain the social security number and card, he was able to construct his new identity around it. He met a woman named Kathy in the early 1970s and married her in 1982. The couple had one daughter and remained married until the man Kathy knew as Tom died in 2021. Ted retained at least two of his major interests when he began living as Tom, golf and luxury vehicles. In the 70s, he divided his time between Massachusetts and Florida, pursuing his passion for golf, playing on the professional winter tour in Florida during the off-season, and working as a club professional at the Pembroke Country Club, south of Boston, the rest of the year. He eventually moved up from giving lessons to becoming the manager at the club. Tom then began a career selling luxury cars, working at various dealerships over the course of 40 years. According to friends of Thomas Randall, 
His personality was very similar to the one Ted had displayed prior to his fixation with the Thomas Crown Affair and the idea of being a high-class criminal. They described him as being the definition of a gentleman, with a gentle soul, polite manner, and articulate way of speaking. He was even-tempered and almost never raised his voice. One friend said he probably wouldn't have believed Tom if he had told him the truth about his identity and the stolen money, because it seemed so out of line with his personality. The only suspicious detail anyone could identify in retrospect, aside from the fact that Tom always had a beard, was the fact that Tom never mentioned his parents or siblings, and only spoke of his early life in very broad terms. While the friends of Thomas Randall, who have spoken to the media, were all shocked to learn that he had deceived them for so long, none of them were particularly upset with their late friend on account of his crime. They largely dismissed the theft as a youthful indiscretion, and the actions of Ted Conrad in his youth did not color their opinion of the more mature Tom Randall, who, as one of them pointed out, did not continue into a life of further crime, as far as anyone knows. While Ted, living as Tom, was able to build his life around country clubs and luxury cars, he did so through his employment, not by being wealthy himself. Despite the massive financial head start the money he stole could have given him, he struggled financially. As Thomas Randall, he and his wife filed for bankruptcy in 2014. According to court records, they had over $160,000 in credit card debt. When he died in 2021, the family was still struggling, with unpaid bills continuing to pile up. Authorities are still investigating what happened to the stolen cash. They are currently investigating the possibility that Ted lost it all, with a series of bad investments shortly after he stole it. While Tom's loved ones are still struggling to cope with the news of his crime and real identity, Ted's loved ones are relieved to know what happened to him after he fled. Ted's sister was afraid she would die without ever knowing what became of her younger brother, and is relieved to know that he went on to live a happy life. Ted's best friend Russell hopes to one day meet Kathy Randall so he can tell her stories of what her husband was like when he was younger. Ted Conrad never got the satisfaction he thought pulling off his crime would bring him, and investigators never got to conclude the case with the arrest they spent decades trying to make. While the case never got the dramatic conclusion anyone envisioned, U.S. Marshal Peter Elliott takes some satisfaction in knowing that the efforts his father made in his decades-long investigation ultimately helped identify Conrad, even though the case was not solved until after his father was gone and Conrad escaped arrest through his death. In the press release announcing that Ted Conrad had been identified, Peter is quoted as saying, I hope my father is resting a little easier today knowing his investigation and his United States Marshal Service brought this closure to a decades-long mystery. Everything in real life doesn't always end like in the movies.